Hello everyone, good evening, morning, afternoon from wherever in the world you are joining from. It's Muhammad Ishan Zahir with you from Dubai. And first of all, we warmly welcome you to our today's webinar on speed to insight at the speed of thought. It is jointly organized by Hub of Finance Transformation, Hoft, and the Bahrain chapter of ICAP members. So we are highly grateful, first of all, to all the audience for taking our time to join this session and also we are thankful to the management committee of uh, ICAP Bahrain chapter to collaborate with us in our weekly webinar series uh, that is empowering finance professionals to play business centric roles at the forefront. So we have started this series almost uh, two and a half months back and today is the week 11 of our session and we have collaborated for the rest of the session with That's the Bahrain chapter of ICAP members and we'll be having joint session in the coming weeks as well. So. Uh, as you all know that uh, we are living in uncertain time because of the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic and in fact we are li living in a VUCA environment where volatility, uncertainty and complexity, ambiguities are the new business realities and being in the finance department, especially in the FPNA function, of course, we have to play the crucial role in the financial planning and analysis because our operational and strategic planning is also of course integrated with our financial planning. So FPNA need to be more agile and they need to increase the speed of thought. That's what uh, Brian is going to talk about and how we can leverage analytics as well to improve our forecasting cap capacity and capabilities in the FPNA functions and how we can leverage technology and uh, most importantly, how we can leverage data analytics. And also it is very important for us to understand uh, what's the new normal looks like for the FPNA professional. So that's all uh, Brian is going to talk about. So regarding the Brian Kalish, uh, he's uh, FPN a thought leader and the principal at Kalish Consulting based out in uh, Washington DC, USA. And he's a global FPN thought leader and also a global speaker on the area of FPN and also the emerging and digital technology. He used to travel almost all different parts of the world to for his FPN roundtable conferences. And since the outbreak of COVID-19, he's doing the virtual conference as well uh, from the USA. So, uh, he has a rich corporate experience of almost 25 years in the field of FPNA treasury and finance. So of course we can get lots of value from him uh, from this webinar. So just before moving on, I will just like to quickly take you to our uh, platform that is a hub of finance transformation. Hoft. It is basically formed to transform accounting to support the global community of finance professionals who aspire to transform themselves into more business centric role like the finance business partner ultimately to the role of a strategic finance leader. And one of our core values, as you can see, it's the collaboration because we have collaborated with some leading finance experts from different parts of the world, as you can see, including from the USA, from UAE, from Pakistan, from Dubai. So these are all our experts. And also Brian, as you can see, Brian Kalish is also one of our strategic contributor at Hoff who used to share his research and different all the new developments in the field of finance, FPNA, even during this time of pandemic in the scenario planning and FPNA. So these are all our contributors and we have found one uh, strategic finance leadership framework. So these are our six pillars. Uh, that's in, on the right hand side is on the technical side, financial, operational, strategic, technology, and on the left, it's public and personal. So we collaborate with all these uh, experts, subject matter experts who have expertise in different areas from this leadership framework and they used to share their experience and their expertise in each of these areas. So that's what our purpose is and our sole purpose is to support the global community of finance professionals who want to transform their careers and who want and in fact our mission is to as you can see it's to form a global uh, network of and community of highly polished tech savvy strategic minded finance professionals and during the last six months almost 1200 finance professionals have joined us already so we in just during a period of last six months we have grow, uh, grown to the members of 1200s almost and they are almost from different parts of the world and still they are joining us so that's what all about and now i will uh, request the management committee of uh, barry and i kept chapter to say a few words and then we can uh, give the session to brian uh, thank you dishan uh, thank you for your coordination for uh, arranging this event uh, i would like to welcome participants especially from uh, Bahrain chapter of ICAP members. Uh, I would like to inform them that we have uh, coordinated for two events. So uh, one event is today that has a very interesting topic and we are going to learn a lot from this event. 
next event is on 17 october that is also uh, that had quite uh, interesting content that uh, is uh, relevant to our members we we decided we i have been attending uh, uh, sessions of huft and uh, they they have been doing a very good job uh, they have uh, some interesting topics to cover and uh, usually we are covering more technical accounting and finance related uh, uh, topic so they have uh, been doing a wide ranging uh, leadership and uh, uh, strategy subjects so i think we will continue our cooperation even in the uh, future and uh, we can bring some interesting uh, topics of, uh, for the members of hft and also for the uh, members of variant chapter so comes to us uh, through the session okay okay brian uh, now over to you So it's great to be with everyone here today. Um, as uh, as uh, it, it was said earlier, uh, good morning, good good day, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where everyone is. Uh, it's about 10:30 uh, a.m. here in the United States, um, but I know folks are in all parts of the world, and we may actually have some people that are over the date line, and it may actually be Sunday for them. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as we were chatting before the the, uh, the conversation started, is um, typically I have an annual trip that I go to Dubai, and actually I should physically be there right now according to my original schedule. Um, so uh, I'm sorry that I'm not delivering this uh, in person, but uh, I think uh, as so many other parts of the world have found, we have uh, we've just had to pivot. So when, uh, the, when the world kind of changed here in the United States so in March, we were actually not too far away from here for me for about uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we were thinking, we do these round table, we were doing these round tables around the world usually once a month. And we were thinking, you know, on Thursday, March 12th, we were saying, well, maybe this is the last dinner we're going to have out. Um, as it turned out, it was. Um, but it, it's been incredible in organizations like ICAP and, and uh, uh, HOF, um, HOFT have shown how quickly we can adapt to doing uh, a lot of our work virtually. So the plus is, um, you know, uh, I can be here in Washington, D.C. and talking to folks all around the world. Um, I very much look forward to, to traveling again. I love seeing people face to face and being able to have an opportunity to break bread and, and, and talk about different topics. But um, this is the world that we're in today. But I, like I said, I think we've, we've learned a lot. We've definitely moved the needle from a technology standpoint. Um, I believe a lot of the cultural barriers have, have been knocked down in the sense that maybe organizations weren't comfortable having their people um, uh, telework, uh, work remotely. Uh, you know, some folks were not interested in doing video conferencing. Uh, before March, and obviously, if, if you're not interested in, in, in doing things on this kind of a platform, you're not, you're not really meeting. So it's been an extraordinary time. Obviously, it's a it's a very difficult time. Um, it's always a little tricky to talk about it from the business perspective because you have to take the whole human element out of it. Um, but we have a lot learned a lot. And one of the things, and, and the reason that I that I titled today's session what I did, the speed, the insight, the speed of thought, is that's really the world that we're in today. I would say the big change that happened from what I affectionately refer to as VC before COVID was there was always the speed to insight. Like people definitely wanted, you know, how quickly can we take our data and transform it into insight and not just information. And, and you know, that's not just stop there for a second. It's not semantics. The difference between information and insight is insight is information that is actionable. So in the sense that if, if we think about us all being in a room together, everyone has a tremendous amount of uh, information that others don't have, but it's a much smaller um, subset about how much information you have that can help me make a better, faster, smarter decision. So that's why it's important when we talk about insights versus information. But because of the level of uncertainty that we're operating in, the, there's a term that we use called VUCA, V-U-C-A. It refers to the degree of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. 
And I would argue it would probably, and maybe even hopefully, this is the greatest level of Volca we'll ever see. Um, and so what's happened is you have to be able to take your data, convert it into insights really at that speed of thought because the world's changing so much. The fact that what happened last week doesn't necessarily indicate what's going to happen next week. Um, we have organizations that have very robust, even artificial, you know, they were modeling with artificial intelligence and they've basically taken, turned those machines off because a great portion of that's built on historical data, which right now isn't helping us, right? What happened six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years ago, is it telling me about what's going to happen tomorrow, um, next week or next month? So that's the general uh, synopsis of what we're going to kind of talk about this morning or today. Uh, myself, real quick, uh, right, uh, the, the quick introduction. I have my own firm here in Washington, D.C. Um, I work with partners. Uh, one of my partners is eCapital Advisors in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm the expert and resident there. And then actually just the semester, uh, I've started teaching at Florida International University in Miami, Florida uh, on the topic of FP&A. So just a quick little roadmap. I'm very much, uh, if anyone's ever talked, uh, heard me speak before or, or seen any of my writings, um, I'm very process focused. Uh, and I think I'm very sensitive to it because it's a weakness of mine. If you if you think about the really the four pillars of FP&A or finance in general being people, process, technology, and culture, uh, process is definitely my weak spot. And so I make a great effort to focus on it because you know that's bas basically whether you're preparing for an exam, uh, just anything in life is what, whatever you can perceive being honest with yourself where your weaknesses are, um, that's really where you should focus uh, your efforts to improve. So I focus very much on process, but really just kind of talk about where analytics came from, you know, how we're adapting to the new environment, um, how we potentially can accelerate and move up the analytics maturity curve. And then certainly we've got time for, for questions and answers. Uh, I don't know if we covered it or not, but I would say at this point, if you have questions, just go ahead and write them in the chat. And then uh, Muhammad, if you want to either wait till the end or just read them out um, as you get them, I'm very comfortable addressing questions on the fly. So however you want to do it, feel free. Um, so if we kind of move along into kind of analytics origin, I always start, um, with this graphic or something similar to it when I was in Dubai last year talking. Um, the one trick is it's, it's you know, when you're talking to uh, in person to people, it's always nice to use a, um, a dynamic slide. Uh, you know, as we live now in a world of uh, smartphones and iPads, everyone will look up if you think you're in a room of 50, 60 or 500 people, you know, everyone looks up on the screen. But I really do like this slide um, because it kind of addresses a couple of I can create a model that solves any problem. So on the left, for example, it's basically create a model that proves that the earth is the center of the universe. And, and I can do that and the math is, is, is pretty complex, but I can explain the movements of the, of the planets with the earth as the center. On the other hand, I can say, well, what would, what would the model look like if we say, you know, the sun is the center of the universe? Well, it's a really clean model. And so for me, you know, the, the two points I kind of take away from that is, you know, Einstein said, you know, all models should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And then it just kind of brings into the whole general philosophy. Um, there's a term called Occam's razor. And basically the premise is, is that given two um, potential answers, usually the simpler answer is going to be the more right answer. So again, I, 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 to me, this is just a nice way to kick things off the idea that I can make the numbers say anything I want them to. Uh, wh however great your model is, it's, it's wrong, uh, it's a but it could be useful. Um, and you wanna keep things as simple as possible. So um, just kind of to, to level set um, the group here today, uh, one of the organizations that I, I partner with is uh, APQC which stands for the American Productivity and, and Quality Center. So it's a, it's a nonprofit that does a lot of research um, uh, on both uh, the accounting side, but also on the finance side. And they recently, you know, you can see from the, 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 the source there recently did an assessment 
And really the idea was it kind of sets the stage. We just kind of want to give you a sense of where people you know, stand in terms of their actual practice, uh, their maturity level when it comes data analysis and monitoring and, and reporting performance. So pretty actually pretty evenly spread out. So it's just important for people to understand that all companies, they can be big, small, you can be anywhere geographically, uh, public, private, uh, doesn't matter on in the industry that that organizations are all what I would consider all, all on different points of their journey on their analytic journey. So again, it's more you know for for the audience to kind of kind of assess where you think you know you would you would uh, land. you know, closed loop, you know, self-adjusting, you know, uh, algorithms. And that's where you're really getting into machine learning and artificial intelligence. But, you know, you know, the largest group is using predictive analytic techniques. Um, but again, everyone's just kind of on a different point on the curve. And really what we're always trying to do is help people get to that next level if that's what they desire. And then when we kind of just kind of to close out on the, on the monitoring and reporting performance, again, a pretty equal distribution. Uh, again, about that, that 19, 20% actually are, are pretty far, what we consider very mature, uh, where they're using, you know, closed group, you know, real-time reporting, but about 20%, you know, really isn't doing much either. So again, the whole point being is that you as an, as an organization can be anywhere on this curve, and it's just a question of where you are. I just do think it's important when we, you know, can take good research like this and explain to people that, organizations are all over, you know, they're all on different points of the curve. And so even if you view your organization more on the immature side, as far as the analytics journey, there's plenty of, you have plenty of company. And from an aspirational standpoint, can you get up the curve? Organizations are doing that. So, you know, just for a question for yourselves to think as we begin to move along in the, uh, in the conversation is like, you know, when we think about analytics, and you know, what are those pain points? And, you know, not surprising, these are kind of the top five that we see. It's, you know, it's hard to access data from legacy systems. There's too many, you know, disconnected data sources, uh, data accuracy concerns, limited real-time uh, analytics and visualization, and limited self-service reporting. So if you kind of think about those challenges, and it's not that any of them are mutually exclusive. You could have all five, but those are really the five uh, main or the greatest pain points that we see when we talk to organizations. And so what we're trying to solve for is we really want to empower the employees and especially here in what we're considering, you know, the new normal. I mean, where we stand today is we're in a new normal, um, but at some point we're going to get out of this. There is going to be some kind of a, uh, we'll have some kind of new, new normal that we'll be moving towards. It'll probably be some kind of a hybrid in, environment. We're probably not going to go back to where we were BC before COVID. But on the other hand, we, we won't be operating this level of incredibly high Volca where, you know, we need to forecast so many of our, of, of our key drivers every day because the level of uncertainty will drop. And so the rate of forecasting should drop with it. But really what we're thinking about in a real holistic approach is we want to be able to deliver, you know, consistent reporting and dashboarding um, to our employees. That's both in finance, but that's also with our business partners. Um, again, to be able to move up that analytics curve, there's got to be much more self, uh, you know, self-service reporting. Uh, when our business uh, uh, partners want reports, we want them to be able to pull it to themselves. If they can, you know, a basic rule of thumb is if we can get them to do, you know, 95% of the reporting by themselves, that they can just pull it, great. And then really just focus our people, our FP&A folks on that 5% that's going to take kind of a deeper dive because we don't want to be glorified, you know, report generators. That's kind of the, that lowest element. You got to have it, right? You have to be generating reports, but it's how you're going to do it because I'm a huge believer in what's called the three C's. It's capacity, capability, 
and collaboration. Because if I don't have any capacity, I can't do anything. And so anything I can do to free up my capacity, whether it's pushing out more reporting to be self-serve, whether it's using RPA, robotic process automation, to take processes and, and move them off my plate. Typically, you know, what we're trying to do is move low IQ activities off of high IQ people's desks. You know, that helps us build capacity. Kind of the, the ultimate goal that I, I know in my career we've always been looking for is this true drill down capability, right? If you need the level of granularity, and not everyone needs, you know, to go beyond, you know, let's say even the, the general ledger level of, of detail. They don't need to see every invoice. They don't need to see every check. But some folks do. They want to be able to see every transaction. That technology exists today. You can get down to every purchase. And if you think about, if you use the example of retail, if you can understand everything your customer is doing, well, then you can figure out what the total value of that customer is and then figure out how do you, you know, for your, for your more profitable customers, how do you get them to buy more? Same thing if you see customers that aren't so profitable, do you have the opportunity to improve it? Or if you see that they're probably going to cease to be a, a, a customer in the near future, then do you, you know, basically cut back spending on trying to, to, to hold them? But, give, but you have to have the data to understand that. And you've got to be able to drill down into the most rawest form of, of your data. And then, of course, you want to be able to do your exception reporting. Again, that kind of goes back to capabilities. You know, if 90% of it is all in line, then, you know, we shouldn't have humans, you know, make, you know, basically checking off saying that everything's right. We really should be focused on where the variances are, where we're outside the ranges that we're interested in. Okay. So when we think about the user experience, you know, so whether it's ourselves and FP&A, it's our business, as partners, what we want is we want speed, we want accuracy, we want consistency, we want to be able to save time, and we want to have flexibility. So just a moment to, um, for folks that may know me, um, I have, uh, uh, I do have a little bit of a history background. So I'm, I'm a believer to understand, uh, you know, where you are, where you have to understand where you've been. So just want to take a moment to go through a quick 5,000 year history of analytics, if I may. So, you know, we've always had tools. And I think what's important is for people to understand is, you know, when we think about all the tools that exist today, and obviously they're very different than the first abacus that was created, but they're tools, they're not solutions. You've got to have the people, you have to have the processes and the right culture to leverage the tools. So just a just for a moment, we sit there and go, okay, well, you know, what, what's the history of tools? Well, again, go back 5,000 years ago, we saw the first abacus. When we want to think about the first true calculator, that was actually in the 1640s in France. The first computer was actually in the 1830s in England with the analytics machine. And that's kind of something that we probably are a little more familiar with today, you know, even though this is a big mainframe computer, but this was in 1946 with the ENAC. And if you happen to have seen the movie or read the book Apollo 13, The Imitation Game, uh, Hidden Figures, um, you know, this is what they were talking about, these just these massive machines with wires. Uh, but they were able to do transactions at incredible speeds. So if, to, to, to highlight the, the movie and the book Hidden Figures for, for a moment, it was about the space program here in the United States. And we used to refer to humans as computers. And these were people that we hired that could just do math really fast. And we would just refer to them as the computers. Well, when the IBM came online uh, in, the, in the mid 60s, they realized that their jobs were gonna go away. They couldn't compete with, you know, with the new IBM, but they understood that you would need people that needed to run the machine. So I do like to take this point because there's always change. People, you know, I mean, humans as, as just as a function of nature is we don't like change. Uh, we're not, most people aren't comfortable with change. But organizations and people that are really successful are those that not only don't resist change, but they embrace change. And actually, you can make it a competitive advantage as an individual, but as actually as an organization. So really what kind of changed our world was like 1971, Intel introduced the first, uh, the, the 4004 microprocessor. Um, it was basically just to take my notes here for a second because I always like to be absolutely correct. 
Uh, it was the world's first commercially available microprocessor. Um, it basically set the stage for the boom in, in computer development that continu continues to this day. It is fast forwarding a little bit faster. This, if you look at the screenshot, actually, that probably doesn't look too different than, than what we see when we use Excel today. Uh, but this was actually VisiCal. Uh, it was created in, in 1978 by a company called VisiCorp. Um, it was, excuse me, go back up for a second, sorry. Um, sorry, having problems here. Um, Sorry, I just have a technical issue that I'm just cleaning up real quick here. Sorry. So, you know, it came out in 1978. Uh, it's called VisiCal because it was the first visual calculator. Um, and, you know, it, it really changed the world because now we had the ability, um, you know, to do bread, excuse me, to do the spreadsheets digitally. Um, for those of you that might be a little bit older and maybe closer to my age, there was a product that rolled out in, uh, in 1983 called Lotus 123. Uh, it was incredible. I actually used it in university. Uh, but to give you an idea of how much technology has changed, uh, it was a dummy computer with dual drives, five and a half, uh, five, excuse me, five and a quarter inch floppies, and you basically would load it in, do your work, and pull it back off. Well, boom. Uh, something we're probably much more familiar with today is Excel. Excel came in, basically took over the entire market. You know, if we were in a room together, we could all say, how many people use today use Excel today? You raise your hands 100%. Um, it's a great tool. It's not going to go away, um, but it does have limitations. Um, so from version control, from audit control, um, basically, you probably shouldn't be, you know, modeling in a, in a, in a cell-based environment. You know, there's some tremendous tools that people have built over the years, but it's because of the world that we operated in. So Excel is never going to go away. I love Excel. Um, the flexibility is tremendous, but on the other hand, you know, I also kind of joke here, you know, I also have pen and paper, right? We still use pen and paper. Why? It, it might be a little more generational too, but that's one way of taking notes. I guess, you know, you could take notes on a tablet all day long if you wanted to, but sometimes it is just easier. So again, there's nothing wrong with having tools. You just want to understand what the tool is used for and what you can use with it. Um, you know, there's two kind of common thoughts are, you know, when all you, you know, for example, you know, when all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Um, and then we do another session on, on KPIs. And, and one of the questions that we ask the audience off the bat is show them a picture of a do it yourself company. So like a, a here in the US, a Home Depot or, or Lowe's and say, you know, what's the, what's the best tool in a store? And people will throw out all sorts of ideas and we kind of stop after a moment or two and we go, well, just so you know, it's actually a really bad question because the question should be, what problem are you solving for before you can figure out what your tool is? So, you know, what I said was you know, the reason I think that we got really good at using Excel was because we kind of had this bifurcated world. You were either large enough to have one of the big three and, and nothing against any, you know, any, any software company. I am completely agnostic. I'm not here to sell a product uh, because my, my whole thing is if, if I don't understand your problem, I can't come up with a solution for you. But where we were was either you were big enough that you could have an IBM or an SAP or an Oracle. It was just interesting back in 2007, they bought Hyperion business objects and Cognos, um, or you were in an Excel world. And so we had this tremendous, you know, you know, bifurcation and people got really good at Excel and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I you know, typically don't like to read um, uh, the screen to anyone, but I do do just for emphasis here. I love this point about, you know, the fact that in this bifurcated world, you know, innovation really suffered. Um, you know, the quote being is that that's a really innovative approach. I'm afraid it's, it, we can't consider it because it's never been done before, which kind of kills the idea of innovation. Uh, but that was kind of the world that we were in. Um, and then we had a kind of an, an interesting development. It was the, the cloud was introduced. And so as I was preparing for our, for our conversation today, I just kind of went back through my personal notes, you know, like when did I learn about um, the cloud? And, and what I found was I actually learned about it right when it came out. So back in February of 10, so we're just past the 10 year anniversary of actually having the cloud uh, that uh, Microsoft introduced Azure uh, literally in that month. And the only reason I learned about it was I was actually at a conference and there were vendors that were talking about cloud solutions. And again, I come from the finance side, so I had no idea what they were talking about. So, you know, it was literally starting from, from point zero of explaining the cloud to me. But, you know, like I said, 
Microsoft introduced Azure, Rackspace and NASA came out with OpenStack in July of 10. Uh, IBM announced Smart Cloud in March of 11. And then Oracle announced the cloud back in, in, in June of uh, 2012. So all of a sudden, because of the need for innovation, because there was a demand that from all those companies that they were some, you know, they were either in Excel or you were in this, you know, or have to play in the big three, there was a huge space, there was an opportunity. And so all of a sudden we created an infrastructure that would permit us to operate. And so what we saw was just this, you know, explosion of products that were out there. So all of a sudden we went, you know, hundreds if not thousands of now there's new budgeting and forecasting and planning and data visualization and predictive analytics and running scenarios and running simulations so you know you just had all these products again this is just a snapshot of some that are out there i'm not endorsing anyone over anyone else but you know all of a sudden we had this huge change we had new planning tools new this tools new bi tools so it really changed the world but also made it a lot harder for finance people because we were no longer you know just having to ask IT what we have. So, you know, one of the things that, that I always stress with people is that your um, IT people should not be telling you what tools to buy because they have no idea what you're trying to do. Now they have a role as far as making sure that the tools that you're interested in can fit into your infrastructure. But if your IT people are telling you which planning tool you should be purchasing, what forecasting tool, uh, consolidation tool, modeling tool, uh, that's not their place because they have absolutely no idea what you're doing. So where, you know, where are we in the current environment? So, you know, again, just a quick snapshot for people to think about themselves. You know, when you think about your, the challenges you have with your data, you know, where are those pain points? Is it too much uh, ETL, which is extract, transform, and load? Do you have slow refresh times? You know, do you have very poor poor uh, query responses? Um, one of, you know, you know, there's no actionable insights and there's no self-service. Well, again, not surprising. You know, these are, these are, these are kind of the top challenges that we see when we're talking to organizations. Uh, so when we think about the kind of the, the traditional data approach that we've seen over, you know, most of the last 20 years or so, um, you know, you have your data sources. And again, those are just some names that are out there, but you have multiple data sources. You have to go through some level of ETL. There has to be some transformation. Uh, and if you have a, you know, that, that, that if you have a data warehouse, that's where it goes. You might have to do some additional, you know, on the bottom, you know, some more processing to get into a data mart so that you can get it into, you know, your reporting tools and meet the requirements you have. And then maybe you can get it into some kind of a BI tool. So this is very typical. There's nothing wrong with it. It's the best technology that we've had for the last 20, 25 years. Or this may be a form, you know, a, 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 a slide that's very familiar to you where it's not even so much a matter of getting, you know, our data into a warehouse, it's just getting into Excel and doing some level of what we call, you know, Excel gymnastics or data wrangling, you know, to then we get that into our reporting and then uh, ultimately get it into our BI tool. Um, you know, but again, it's a very slow, brittle, rigid way of, of, of moving data to get us those insights. One of my big takeaways for today that I, that I would like to just uh, in, inform, you know, the audience about is the fact that there's a new way of doing things. Again, not getting into products whatsoever, but more the fact that the technology exists. And I would challenge that probably your IT people have no idea, right? They're not forced to do this. And it's still relatively new, maybe two and a half, three years old. Uh, but it's this whole concept of, of direct made, excuse me, direct data mapping. And basically what you're talking about is you take all your data sources, maybe you've got 50 data sources. It can be internal, external, structured, unstructured, and you're able to put it into your, what we call the data mapping, you know, engine, or you can think about it as analytics hub, but in its raw form. And then that way from your reporting requirements and getting into your BI tools, it doesn't all have to be engineered ahead of time. And the other thing too, is because you're only refreshing the parts that you want, the speed is incredible. And, and I, Freely admit it can sound like magic, but you can take refresh times of a day and get them down to minutes. And so this to me is as, as we're thinking about, you know, really speed to insight at the speed of thought, how do we get this? Because the problem was 
we oftentimes would ask a question and the answer is, I don't know, because either we couldn't get access to the data, the data was too expensive, or by the time we got it, it, it wasn't timely anymore. And I would argue that the, the data war is, has been conquered, that that data is basically free, unlimited, and immediate. But having access to our data doesn't give us those insights that we transform into knowledge that help us make those better, faster, smarter decisions. So we have to figure out a way, how can we speed it up? And that's what's really important. That's one of the real big takeaways I have for you today is there is this technology that keeps data in its source shape, is its um, uh, relationship aware. So when one thing changes, it changes across the entire system. So it changes your forecast, it changes your budget. You know, you have version control. So, you know, obviously it's manageable. And then the other thing, this is what's changed so much is it performs against billions of records. We now operate in a world of what's called Bronto bytes. This is 10 to the 27th power. It's a massive amount of data, like you were saying, excuse me, structured, unstructured, internal, external, and then Understanding our data um, using Gartner as a, as a reference, I mean, Gartner believes that 80% of all data is dark, and I'll explain that in a second, and 93% of unstruct, unstructured data is dark. And dark just means it exists within your organization and you either don't know you have it or other than the basic acquisition of it, you're not doing anything with it. So if we think about the masses of, a massive amount of data that's out there, the amount that we're not even leveraging. We need technology to help us do it because we're way past the point of throwing humans and spreadsheets at trying to solve these problems. And this is just, I'm just gonna fly through these screens really quick, but this is a real example. So I, I, I wanted to share this because I've, you know, basically filtered away all the names and the product, but it's real. What I'm talking about is not science fiction, it's, it's, it's technology. And so, you know, the, this is from a retail company that, uh, that I work with. And basically, we just had the good fortune that we went live with this. It was a fourth quarter 19 project. We went live in January of 2000. So it was before COVID hit. And so all of a sudden, they have this great insight to their organization, basically at the speed of thought. And so think about it. They're a retailer. They have brick and mortar stores. They had to close all the stores when COVID hit. It flipped to going 100% online. Their uh, composition of their uh, purchases changed dramatically. It was kind of a more of a leaning to a to men more men's products than women's products. So it was two thirds men's products were selling in before COVID and one third women. Once it went online, that got flipped completely upside down. It then went two thirds women, one third men. But having access to your data gets you down to whatever skew you want to think about. So you can get it down to, you know, get it down to the store and get it down to the product and get it down to the materials. And again, uh, the purpose here isn't to go through all these slides, but it's just saying, these are all the different ways you can look at your data. And again, as close to real time as possible, you know, breaking things down by, you know, by geographics, so it's the USA here in our states and being able to click on a particular state, Texas or Florida, and then drill down to see what are my top 10 performers? What are my bottom 10 performers? What's been increasing by the most over the last week? So all it's all about being able to drill down to your data to get those insights to help you make those decisions in as close to real time as possible. And then again, just because we're dealing with COVID, what we were able to do is bring in outside data. So we were actually able to take COVID case information from the CDC, from Johns Hopkins University, and then be able to start running, you know, predictive models that not where COVID was going to happen, uh, but when COVID was picking up, how would the change in behavior be? Because Again, we saw New York get hit hard really first and we could see what happened. And then all of a sudden, so whether you're using Python or Spark and you can start doing some predictive analytics because that's the other thing that's really important right now. I mean, the focus, what I've really spent the last six months on, it's all about data analytics. It's about scenario planning and it's about RPA, robotic process automation, because people are realizing their processes you know, can be done much better. Again, here's just snapshots of, of you know, cases versus sales. And you literally, and it's not causal, but at least you could understand what the relationship is. And again, seeing what's happening at local levels. Again, one thing, so kind of pivoting out of, out of, out of technology as far as analytics, I'm a huge uh, advocate um, on data visualization. I think it can be done a lot better. 
Um, I'm, I feel very strongly about there's a, a nonprofit. So you see with APQC and IBCS, I, I love working with nonprofits. Uh, but there's just an idea that, you know, we can, the way we present our information, whether it's in reports, whether it's in dashboards, whether it's in presentations, uh, there's, we can just do a much better job. Uh, again, we, we have sessions that we talk about this uh, exclusively, but the whole idea is when you look at a dashboard like this, you know, you have to explain to me what it means, right? It's not obvious to me. Um, and the real idea behind IBCS, International Business Communication Standards, is that we use systemic notation. So the idea is you, you can sit there and say, okay, there's patterns that I can see, right? You know, red is bad, green is good, everything's moving left to right and bottom to top. And we would just want our information to be presented in a consistent form because then we take away the time you thinking about that, that capacity, right? If I don't have to spend any time explaining what people are looking at, whether it's someone in the C-suite, whether it's one of my business partners, whether it's my coworkers, right? That's efficiency. That's, that's gonna get us much more focused on what the numbers are telling us than what the numbers are. So I would encourage folks to, you know, explore IBCS. Again, it's not a product, it's a, it's a philosophy, but uh, I'm a true believer. And then kind of, you know, you know how, do, how do we, you know, accelerate analytics? And, you know, we were talking about this earlier, you know, the question being, you know, where are you on your analytics journey? And so kind of the, it may be one of the next questions that we have, but it's like, you know, are you, you know, is the organization folks that focused on, you know, providing descriptive and diagnostic uh, analytics, which is really focused kind of on, you know, thinking about looking at the, you know, backwards, right? What happened and, 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 and where did it happen? Whereas when we start getting into, you know, start asking the question of why, you know, what will happen, what can we do about it, you know, getting into predictive, prescriptive, and ultimately cognitive um, analytics. Again, there's no right answer for where an organization should be, but if it aspires to be at a higher level than it is, then it just needs to have its people, process, technology, and culture, you know, in sync so that you can succeed. Uh, again, kind of the general question here and watching our time, you know, again, for the audience, you know, really, what do you feel you spend, you know, the majority of your time on what kind of analytics? And so when, again, just kind of looking at the journey in a slightly different way, you know, you know, you have to start with, you know, what we call data understanding, right? What's my data telling me? And that's, you know, that's where we're leveraging BI, you know, and then we think about, well, how can we build our capacity to do, you know, basically have the time and, the, and free up the resources to do higher level analytics? Well, that's process automation. That's robotic process automation. That's, you know, again, taking anything, again, we can spend tons of time on this, but really it comes down to any process, it doesn't matter how complex it is, but as long as it's mappable, I can automate it. And what's incredible today is that the price to do it continues to drop, the ease continues to increase. Um, and I'm, I'm a true believer in extreme um, automation. I think in the next five years, Everything that can be automated will be automated and that will free up our people. I look at automation as equally liberation to free up our people to then again, move up the curve, start doing, you know, predictive analytics, you know, you know, how can my data help me, you know, understand the future. And then ultimately, as we get more and more comfortable is getting into, you know, really cognitive um, analytics and basically leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence, you know, can my you know, data autonomously make decisions again, making you know decisions but obviously with the human element is always overriding it so again if you can it's about efficiency if if what is routine is 75 percent of what your job is let's move that 75 percent off and just focus on that really high value 25 percent where humans are really good and then leveraging uh from my friends at the um Financial Analytics Institute, uh, Robert and uh, and Jasper, kind of again thinking about how, how do you achieve next generation uh, FP&A? You've got your basics and your acumen and your intelligence and strategy. Um, you know you want to move from you know improving your efficiencies to providing insight to actually impacting top line growth. You know, historically, focusing on reporting and analysis is what FP&A has been about. We really want to get to that next level, which is influencing and impacting our decisions and moving from what's called the you know, trusted scorekeeper to the strategic partner. So, you know, our diverse skill set are our people with their new skills, you know, these incredible tools that are out, you know, give us the ability to, again, move beyond descriptive to diagnostic to predictive, prescriptive, and, and ultimately cognitive analytics. Sorry. 
Uh, you know, and you're just really trying to move from average to world class. And again, it's a function of where the organization wants to be. You know, if the organization is, and what's going to pop up here in a second is a couple of personas that we address. Sorry. So it's kind of, we, we kind of break it into four personas. It's reporting, commentator, advisor, and strategist. And there's nothing wrong with being a commentator if that's where the organization wants to be. But then you just want to make sure you have the right tools, people, process, and technology to be able to achieve that. If you aspire to be a strategist, but you don't hire enough people, you you know don't have the right tools, um, you have poor processes, and maybe the culture isn't even right. It's very hard to get there. And so the idea is, you know, what we see is moving from average to good to great to world class. Uh, and again, this slide is really just talking about you know you have to have a, the people, process, technology, and culture in place to be able to achieve it. So with that, I think we're right on schedule time wise. The one thing I wanted to say, if you're interested in, in, in another webinar that's coming down the pike, I'm, I'm presenting one um, in uh, on the 29th. So feel free uh, to reach out to me or uh, uh, go to JetX is the uh, is the sponsor for it. Uh, but you know, these are kind of some of the things that we're going to be addressing. But with that, um, I'm open to answer any questions or observations that, that anyone may have. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian. I think there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, so the first question is, which programming language are a must in order to be a successful FP&A professional? So I would argue it's open, right? It's, it's really a function of the tools. I mean, when you start thinking about on the predictive side, you know, I see a lot of people using Python and Spark, um, but it's, it's not so much the particular language as the tool that you're using. So it, again, it's, 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 do you have the tool to be able to solve the problem that you want? And then it's really open on the language. I also would have to tell you, honestly, I'm not the tech person. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a finance person. So there's probably smarter people and maybe they're on the, you know, feel free any, anyone that's on, is on our chat today to, 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 to pipe in also. I mean, we want this to be as, uh, uh, as, as open and, and active as possible. But to me, it's not so much the, the computer language, the coding. I mean, you do have that hardcore data scientist, but this is much more, we really, you know, FPA, you want to get away from the point of having to code um, and just being able to leverage the tools. Okay, that's useful. So uh, there is a second question. We can foresee the AI is taking over the job of FPA analyst. So what measure should he take to challenge AI? Well, I would look at AI as being you know, your partner, right? So I, I view things the same thing. So when you so to go down a level, so the you know, kind of that first level would be, you know, RPA, and so robotic process automation, right? And I view the bot, and this is actually how we kind of sell, is the bot is an employee, right? And so IA is not your competitor. IA, really what the advantage of IA uh, is being able to take tremendous amounts of data and finding trends that humans just aren't good at. Right, I mean, it, we, we, we've proven it. it's it's funny. You end up spending a fair amount of my, or I spend a lot, of, a fair amount of my time in, in psychology, because it is about change management and, and and handling. The AI is coming. The robotics are coming, but I view it much more as liberation than something to be feared, because there's always going to be a role for us. I mean, if you think about it, and sorry if I'm getting a little bit off track, but um, you know, most jobs that existed. 40 years ago don't exist today and 40 years forward, they're not going to exist. So there's always going to be things to do. There's always going to be jobs. You just have to think about, I look at it, you know, automation. So whether it's RPA, machine learning, AI is taking away the things I don't want to do, right? And freeing me up to have that capacity to do the things that let me collaborate with my business partners. So it's not anything that I fear. I, I wish my organization would be more adaptive of AI because then it just lets us, again, rise up that, that curve and start, you know, again, think much more strategically and get further and further away from the tackle. Okay, that's right. So the next question is, uh, big data or any new products view or monitor are there? So the BI tools are great. I mean, it's, 
it's just understanding what they can do and understanding the difference between a data visualization tool and a true analytics tool. So, you know, I talk to people who say, well, we, we have Tableau and you go, that's a data visualization tool. So, you know, there's, there's no right tool, right? It depends what problem you're trying to solve for. So again, my, my, my role is not to advocate for any product because I don't know what the, you know, I don't know what we're trying to solve for, but you know, there are, you know, you know, Power BI is a, is, a, is a great tool for people. Um, what we're seeing though, like when I was talking about kind of that, that modern, what we call an analytics booster hub, is it's, it's system agnostic. It's not a system that you have to go and break. So like they have connectors uh, to Tableau and they have connectors to Power BI. So it's, it's really a function of the, the tool that you like using, but do you have that um, analytical firepower behind it? That's really where the value lies. Yeah, and there is one uh, good question from Pankaj. Uh, he's asking uh, because AI is in uh, AI is featured in FPN. Do you believe that other professionals are better positioned to deliver this role? Specifically, I'm referring to statistics. I mean, data scientists and uh, those who involved in the statistics side. Sure. So, I think the data scientists can help. the The challenge that I have seen is they don't understand the business. So there's been, oh, and this is so this is a little U.S. centric view. There's been this, you know, push. Let's go hire, you know, data scientists to run, you know, these really interesting projects. But how does it help me run my business better? So finance, I think, well, they should own it, and because if they don't own it, to I believe the point being is then it's it's going to move somewhere else. But we are kind of that glue that sits on the hub between all the different parts of the organization. Data scientists can, can help and data science can help. Um, but as far as who's delivering in the insights, I, I still think it's, it, it's gonna be finance. At least finance has the opportunity to, to, to be that glue. Um, again, what, I, what I've typically seen is there's been a gap between you know, your hardcore data scientists and anything that's actionable by the company. So it's to me, when I see that kind of, when I see a gap, I see an opportunity. And that's really where fi I think finance and FP&A can fill that gap because what are we, we're good FP&A folks, right? We're, we're quants, we, we know the math, we're great storytellers and we understand the business. Um, and, and so I think that that role is critical. Plus, I'm also beginning to see uh, more and more CFOs are coming up through the FP&A path, maybe not full time, but they did a tour of duty in FP&A. Because again, the skill set, you know, CFOs today in, in the new normal, but as we look at the new new normal, you, you know, the it's moving away from, you know, the historical, you know, financial and managerial accounting and getting much more on the predictive, prescriptive, uh, helping the organization. Okay, that's so very useful, I think. And so, uh, Brian, do you think that uh, finance professionals, they do, they need to acquire some, like, uh, skills and knowledge in the field of statistics or data scientists? Oh, absolutely, right. No, I think the, the more you can learn, um, the, the better, um, again, Part of it is, is educating yourself. One of the things that we find is organizations and, you know, sharing a client story was, you know, we're, we're actually helping them on an, on an RPA project, right, on, on robotics process automation. And they were saying, you know, it's like, because there's, you know, there's got to be trust between, and they're like, I can't buy another product that we don't use. So I think a lot of companies have been frustrated, some of it's self-inflicted, in the sense that they go out, they spend you know, a significant amount of money on new tools, but then don't make the investment in the people on how you can leverage it. So no, I mean, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, it's my obligation on the, you know, as an FP&A professional to, to learn new things. The more skills you develop, the, the better you're gonna be, the more valuable. Again, if you, if you believe that the FP&A is gonna be fundamentally different five years from 
in five years from today, which I truly believe, I think, again, I think anything that's, you know, de dealing with data acquisition, verification, reconciliation is all going to be automated away. A lot of the kind of what I call blocking and tackling relatively simple, you know, mappable activities that we do, all that's going to go away. And so where's the value going to be? It's on the analytics. It's, again, help, you know, it's going to be much more in the business partner uh, to help the organization, you know, stay, not only survive, but really to thrive um, in, in what I hope to see is the new, new normal. That's right. I think we have last two, three minutes. So uh, one question is, in addition to uh, Gartner, what other sources are available to try uh, developments in new tools? And that's the one I'm most familiar with. I don't, you know, it's, it's, it, there, I mean, there are, you know, if you, you know, it's, it's a classic, if you go on the internet and ask about products and how they're doing, um, I know there are other, there are other ranking uh, systems that are out there. Uh, I, just off the top of my head, I don't, again, it, it's just one of the tools that I use, but there are other ways of looking at it. And I'm sure, again, I'm, I'm looking at it from a U.S. centric, so there may be a more prominent one in, um, in, uh, in Europe or in the Middle East. Um, but yeah, I, th that's the one that I'm most familiar with. And again, it's, you're, you're looking at just different, um, uh, uh, excuse me, you're just looking at different views, right? You just, you know, one of the things, and again, not knocking software companies at all, but whenever you're looking at a tool, you want to, A, you should be reaching out. Hopefully everyone can get connected just with the group that we have today and, and things like ICAP there uh, and, and HOFT is you know, leverage your, your network. Um, find out the good, the bad, and the ugly from, from your peers who don't have a monetary interest <laughs> in what systems uh, or tools that you purchase uh, because, you know, uh, not taking again, not trying to be mean to vendors at all, but they're they're always going to overpromise and underdeliver. Or if you need, if you leverage a, a consultant, you want to have a consultant that has a suite of solution because if they're only representing one technology, um, high likelihood that's the technology they're going to recommend to you. So between things like Gartner and, and and other resources that are out there, leverage you know to the extent you're comfortable, leverage you know consultants that uh, again have suites of products, but really leverage your network. Um, one of, I guess one of the big takeaways I have for us before we leave today is fp a is a universal practice. It's not tax. It's not accounting where the, you know, there's a very specific legal set of rules you have to follow. Um, you know, if it's a good planning tool in Dubai, it can be a great planning tool in Detroit or Dublin. So, you know, again, leverage the intellect, you know, the way I like to put it is, if, you know, if we were in person and uh, there, uh, there was a podium between me and you, as I always kind of say, you know, the intellectual firepower on your side of the podium is much greater than on my side. So leverage your network, leverage, whether it's internal or external, um, to understand what people are doing, because the challenges we're facing are truly universal. They're going to be a little bit different company by company, but at the end, it's, it's, it's people, process, technology, and culture. And the more people that you can talk to and leverage their experiences, the better it is for you. <clears throat> That's right. Uh, okay, so we are, I think, already we have reached the time. So can you take one more question, Brian? Can you take Absolutely. I'm fine. Thank okay. you. The, the Bonds to someone who uh, the automated platform can deliver this. When... Sure. Well, I no, I, I think like I said, the, the value proposition changes, and actually the ROI I think will continue to increase. I think, I think the challenge is actually more today than tomorrow. Right? Is that why am I paying people a lot of money per chance, you know, to do things that you know can be automated? So those those things are going to go away. Right? And then what happens is it frees you up, right? It's that, it's that capacity issue, right? You high ROI activities. So I, I look at it as, as a tremendous opportunity. So I, I don't look at it as punishment. I look at it as, you know, you're, you're taking away the parts of my job I don't want to do that, you know, research shows us we've been, we've, we've been stuck in for the last 30, 35 years. But we're truly at a transformational period to really get to that speed inside the speed of thought. 
because again, taking the whole human element out of the, the pandemic, it's forced organizations to fundamentally think about how they do their business. And the idea that, you know, if we can do it remotely, then uh, again, we, it just gives us the opportunity to think about these processes that have been very manual uh, to, to automate them, again, move them off people's plates so that they can then have the time to start answering questions that we've always had, but haven't been able to answer because we haven't had the time I, I truly believe that it's just a question of are they willing to make the investment because there's certainly a cost associated with being able to have uh, the skill set and this ability, but it's no longer where we were again 25 years ago, where you say, well, no matter how much I wish for it, I can't have it. It truly exists today. And I think that's where the transformational component is really going to kick off in the next couple of years, because those companies that leverage the new technology, that in, you know, in, uh, invest in their people to leverage that new technology are the organizations that are truly gonna thrive. And I guess, um, I keep saying my last point, but I'd say I, as far as motivation, just assume that you, whoever your competitors are, they're already doing it. Yeah, I think that that's super useful. So I think that's all. Uh, so now I can, uh, I want to give a, a session to Saeed on the management committee of ICAM members. If you have any questions or comments, so then we can wrap up the session. Saeed or Manib. Uh, th thank you, Zishan, and thank you, Brian. A very interesting and uh, session and many tips and uh, to learn in what, uh, what to learn now and uh, where to follow uh, to improve further. Uh, thank you so much for all the effort that you have done. To and uh, maybe if there is any question, you can give us uh, how we can contact you. Yeah. For me, I want to uh, know more, but I think the time is over now. So we, mm -hmm. anybody who wants to go into more details to check uh, uh, about uh, more details about the subject, they can contact you. Yes, absolutely. So um, I think uh, Mohammed can send out to the group my, my contact information, but I'd love any any questions anyone has. Also, uh, on the networking about it, um, I'm a, a technically, I guess I'm a super user on LinkedIn. So uh, I, I think I don't work for them. I don't get compensated, but it's it's a great tool. But I love connecting with people. You know, it's very I've been very fortunate I've, uh, in my career. I've been able to travel around the world. So I love being able to connect with people. But yeah, uh, if Mohammed, please feel free to, to send out the uh, the information about uh, obviously my contact information to the group. Uh, if you know, please feel free to add the the, the, the webinar that's uh, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I do, like I said, I I've been coming to Dubai for every October for the last number of years, and obviously I, I wish I were there uh, in in Dubai uh, and, and other parts of the Middle East. I was supposed to go to Jeddah this year. I was supposed to go to to uh, Bahrain earlier in the year. So I really look forward to. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, I guess I guess I'm just going to have it as a prop. Unfortunately, a U.S. passport isn't worth very much today. Uh, but hopefully, we'll be in a much better world in, in the relatively new future, um, and uh, I, I'll be able to see a number of you in person. I truly, I, I, I miss seeing people, and so I look forward to being able to uh, to get out again. So again, thank you all so very much for your time today. Thank you for your questions and your attention. Uh, but do feel free to to contact me with questions or link with me on on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, please have a, a be safe, be well. Uh, I'm sure I'm, I'm not the closer, but um, and again, look forward to seeing everyone in the near future. Thank you, thank you, Zishan. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Brian. Yes, Marie. Thank you, Said. And thank you very much. And we can uh, now close the session. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It was really a wonderful session. We have learned a lot. And uh, hopefully we will incorporate uh, all those things in our daily routine. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you.